just to dwell in your house. <coughs> Amen. Good morning. Let's make our way to our seats this morning. Let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise as we get started today. Amen, amen, amen. You can be seated as we just have a few announcements this morning. Amen. Let me get my eyeballs on and we'll get going. Again, I want to welcome everybody to Christian Fellowship Church. As if it's your first time here, raise your hand. We just want to recognize you. Any first time visitors? No. If anybody first time online, glad to have you joining us there. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, anyone in here, you could uh, find the people with the name tags, the door greeters. They could kind of get you in the right direction of which way to go. Uh, we want to remind you to stay connected on uh, social media uh, ways with us. Uh, if you put that up there in your bulletin, you'll notice this QR uh, code. Just scan it with your phone, and it'll bring you to quick links to our website, our Facebook page, where you could do prayer requests, different things you could give online and YouTube. And, and I always say it, if you don't understand this thing, ask your grandchildren, and they'll hook you right up. They understand that perfectly. So uh, next thing is uh, tonight. Everybody say tonight. tonight. Is the Men's Fellowship Supper. Woo! baby we got gumbo and the word but I don't know how we're going to do this I don't know if we should go with the word first before the gumbo because gumbo is like turkey you eat it then you go into a coma about 15 minutes later and so <laughs> maybe I could put some caffeine in the gumbo some kind of way but uh Nathaniel what I want you to do is just flash I don't want to cause people to sin and start lusting so flash this picture the next picture for me Oh, look at that gumbo. Oh, it's good. Oh, so if you want some of that, be here tonight, 6 o'clock, uh, for the men's uh, fellowship supper across the street. Amen. Uh, also, uh, this Monday will be my sister's heart's book club uh, from on Monday the 28th from 5 to 8 p.m. So Monday, tonight we have men's meeting. Tomorrow night is the uh, my sister's heart's book club. Uh, I don't remember what book they're reading, but... Uh, that's a once a month thing. The book club is separate from the women's Bible study. And then on Tuesday, the ladies are going to meet again for uh, my sister's, uh, I mean, women's Bible study. They've been studying lies women believe. Uh, that's Tuesdays at 6 o'clock. Uh, what's the lie this week? Emotions. Emotions. Believing the lies of emotions. Uh, and then uh, this Wednesday is our water baptism. So uh, Wednesday, 7 o'clock, we won't be having the other classes. We won't have youth and kids club that night. Uh, it's just be water baptism. We have several people signed up. Just a reminder, if you're going to be water baptized, uh, bring your form in that uh, you, you pick up on this back wall here if you didn't pick one up yet. Uh, a change of clothes. Come, you could actually come in the clothes you're going to be baptized in. Uh, a change of clothes a bag, like a plastic bag to put your wet clothes in after, and then uh, a towel to dry yourself off. So uh, this Wednesday night, water baptism. Excited about that. We got one of our candidates right there. He's so glad to have uh, Alexa's going to be getting baptized. Let's give the Lord a hand clap in advance. <laughs> we have several people signed up. So again, come on out that night, support them. What we do is have a 20-minute uh at 7 o'clock, we'll have about a 20-minute teaching on what water baptism is, and then we go in for the dunk. Amen. So just want to encourage you to come on out for that. Uh, then on S Sunday, July 11th, this is not next Sunday, but the following. Next Sunday is 4th of July. The ladies are going to be having what's called Come Make the Veille. Uh, you see the older people know that the old French word, Make the Veille. Sister Hazel just put a smile from ear to ear. Right there, come make the veille. They'll be serving coffees, coffee and cookies uh, in the uh, cafe area at 2 o'clock. You see, I thought that said cookies and ice cream. I went to Walmart and bought me a nice little sundress, and I was going to show up to make the veille, but I'm going to return it. it it's, not, it's coffee and cookies. I thought it was cookies and ice cream. I was coming, but uh, that's just open. There's no agenda. They're just going to get to know. Again, we say... Uh, our first step is connect with God and his family. And you need a supporting cast around you of Christian friends that will help you when you're going through things. So go make the veille. How many of you don't know, or that's the first time you heard veille? Most of you heard it? Okay. I know the younger generation uh, doesn't hear the French. Uh, 
I, I was thinking about that word when, when they told me that. I, it like brought back so many memories of because my, my grandpa, my papa, and my daddy just used to talk French to each other. And I miss that. You don't hear it anymore. Uh, so uh, just a little, little bit blast from the past, we could call that. So uh, just want to wish anyone having a birthday between now and next Sunday, happy birthday. Anyone in here? Right there. Happy birthday to you. Sister Jay is going to be having a birthday. Happy birthday to you. Anyone else? All right. If you are online, uh, happy birthday to you. What about anniversaries? Anyone having an anniversary between now and next Sunday? Going up. Brother Junior, what? A birthday or anniversary? Anniversary. anniversary. Happy anniversary to you. Amen. Let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise there. <laughs> Amen. So uh, if you are online, we just want to wish you happy anniversary also. So what we're going to do right now is receive our tithes and offerings. And first thing I want to do is let you know how you can give. Amen. You can, if you're not here, you can mail it to Christian Fellowship Church, Post Office Box 1427, La Rosa, Louisiana, 70373. Or you could give online at www.welcometocfc.com. Or you could text to give. Uh, to that number there. Again, if you're watching this video later, you could just hit the pause so you could get the number to text to and set it up. Uh, but if not, we would love you to be here to give. That's the best way to give. Amen. So let's stand to our feet as we uh, read our scriptures for our offering this morning. <coughs> Excuse me. We've got three scriptures we're going to read. Uh, this is Good News Translation. Proverbs 19.21 says, People may plan all kinds of things, but the Lord's will is going to be done. Romans 8.28 says, We know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, those whom he has called according to his purpose. And I want to just stop here for a second. We know that in all things God works for what? Good. That doesn't say that all things will be good. See, a lot of times people think, oh, everything's just going to be good and work out perfect. But in all things, God works for good. Do you know sometimes our bodies get sick and we have to go through surgery? Anybody in here ever been through a surgery? Right? Go, oh, Brother Adam's blowing the show forward before we start. <laughs> right? Surgeries can be painful, but it's for your good. See, sometimes God has to remove things from our life or place things in our life. And those things that are painful are sometimes used for our good. So it doesn't mean that everything's going to be good, uh, that everything's going to be perfect in our life. First uh, Peter 5, 7 says, leave all your worries with him because he cares for you. Amen. So take your offering in your right hand and repeat after me this morning. Say, as I give in today's offering... I recognize that God is sovereignly involved in directing my life. I understand that I may make my plans, but it is the Lord who directs my feet. God carefully oversees all that happens to me. No event or no experience escapes his attention. I give today with a confidence in the sovereignty of God. The job I have, the business I run, and the money that comes through my hands are under the direction of Almighty God. It is not luck. It is not chance. It is God working on my behalf in Jesus' name. Amen. So if you would, let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise. If you would, we, we got three baskets along the front. Just make your way on up and place your offering in one of the baskets.
Amen, amen, amen. How many of you are ready to worship the Lord this morning? Amen. So let's stand to our feet, uh, the rest of us, and as we have our call to worship this morning. Our call to worship for the month of June is Psalms 105, verses 1 through 3. This is the message paraphrase. Again, uh, I know I've said this many times before, but the message uh, version of the Bible is not a translation. It is a paraphrase of it. Okay, so it's not an accurate uh, translation of it, but it, it is easy as a new believer just to begin reading it so you start to understand things. So it says this, hallelujah. How many of you know what hallelujah means? It means to give praise to God, to give thanks to God. It says hallelujah, thank God, pray to him by name. Tell everyone you meet what he has done. Sing him songs, belt out hymns, translate his wonders into music. Honor his holy name with hallelujahs. You who seek God, live a happy life. Father, we just come to you this morning. Uh, we turn this entire service over to you right now, Father. We ask that you have your way in this place. Fill this place with your spirit this morning, Father God, as we worship you in Jesus' mighty and precious name. And everyone shouts, amen. Let's put our hands together and worship the Lord.
worship Him. Oh, come on and lift your hands. Jesus is here. He's walking in every pew. He's walking up and down the aisle today. Stretch out your hands for what you have need of. Just stretch out your hands. I'm standing at your door. My heart is calling yours. Come fall into my arms.
He says, I'm gonna chase you down.
There is a hope to believe in. Jesus, Jesus. There is true joy in this freedom. So open your heart and receive it. There is a hope to believe in. Jesus, Jesus. And there is true joy. Go look it up. 
We could all use Jubilee. We all need change, amen. We all need change. So I declare for each and every one of you today, for your families and for your children, I'm going to declare it over you. Oh, this is the sound of Jubilee. I declare freedom. I declare hope over you today. I declare freedom in your life today. Freedom, hope, and deliverance in your life today. I declare it today, Jesus. I stand on your word, God. I declare freedom. I declare joy. I declare your peace of God Worry has to go Fear you have to go God, I declare that you open doors That only you can open, Jesus That you open the doors And pay, pay the way Pay the way, God For only what you can do, Jesus For what some people have been praying for For years, God for what some people are declaring and prophesying for years. God, I pray that you begin to open the doors, the things we've been waiting on, and the promises that you have declared over our families and over our children. Lord, I declare doors to be open in the name of Jesus. In your name, Jesus, prodigals come home. Prodigals come home. Open the eyes of the blind, Jesus. Change the heart of those whose hearts are hard toward you. Lord, have your way. Just have your way. Seasons change. The season is changing.
Give the Lord a hand clap of praise this morning. Thank you, Lord. Nathaniel, put that verse, not the last one, the one before that one. I love this. The overwhelming, say those next two words, never-ending, reckless love of God. Oh, it chases me down, fights till I'm found. He leaves the 99. Can I tell you that you, we don't earn God's love in any way? We don't deserve it. God loves you just the way he found you. But can I tell you this? He loves you too much to leave you that way. You hear me? God loves you and accepts you just the way he finds you. But Jesus says that the enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy your life. But I have come to give you what? Life. And that's where he finds us and he gives us salvation. But he says, I love you too much just to leave you the way I found you. He says, I want you to not only have life, but I want you to have life to the full. See, I How many of you are glad that God loves us too much to leave us in our hurt and broken state in our life? That He wants to heal us, deliver us, and set us free. He loves you too much. If He didn't love you that much, He'd just leave you and say, Fini. But He's not finished with us. He, it's, we are a constant work. Amen. Amen. So let's give the Lord one more hand clap of praise.
Amen. I want to go ahead and dismiss our Club 345 and our new generations uh, kids back there. Let's give them a hand clap of praise. Good to see them this morning, everyone there. Hey, Amen. I forgot to turn on my lights so you could see me. Hey, Amen. Did somebody just say I look better in the dark? Who said that? No. <laughs> Amen. If you would, get out your notes as we get started this morning. Amen. I got a, a word the Lord gave me entitled, Fight the Good Fight. Amen. 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 Now, I know this will be hard to believe, but I actually have more notes. I added stuff this morning. <laughs> I, I was thinking about doing more than one part to this message. I didn't know if I could fit everything in one uh, message. And so I kind of cut some things out, but then I slowly did it, added some stuff back in. So uh, we never know where we're going to be with this. Amen. And the worship team, y'all going to be ready to come back up at the end of service, right? Amen. Amen. Because we want a time of refreshing this morning. Who needs a time of refreshing in their life? Amen. Don't we need a good refreshing every now and then? Amen. So as, as you take out your notes, this is called, uh, entitled Fight the Good Fight. And this is Paul talking about his life. He's, it says, I'm already being poured out as a drink offering. But he says this toward the end of his life. He says this. In 2 Timothy 4, 7, three things, and this is what we're going to focus on today. He says, I have done what? Fought the good fight. I have finished the race, and I have kept the faith. And this is, needs to be our declaration that, you know what? We're going to fight the good fight. We're going to finish our race, and we're going to keep the faith. That you, Can I tell you something? You're in a battle. You're in a fight. You may not know that. You may not realize that, and hopefully today, by the end of today, you're going to realize that, that the devil's not happy that you're serving God. Can I tell you that? He's actually more going to try and get you for serving God because he doesn't want you to be healed. He doesn't want you to be delivered. He doesn't want you to be set free. He only comes to steal, kill, and destroy. He wants your life to be miserable so you don't share the gospel, don't share everything with other people. He does it. You're in a fight, but it's up to us. And, and we're going to talk about that in a few minutes. It's us, up to us to fight. We need to, and Paul says, to fight the good fight because you cannot fight a bad fight and it's not good for you. <laughs> you can fight a bad fight, not a not smart way, and, and, and lose. And then he says that you're going to run the race. I have, I have finished my race. Too many times people give up in the middle of the race. And that's what the enemy wants to do, have you give up and have, you have kept the faith. So let, let's move on to our second verse here this morning as we talk about this. Now, Philippians 1, 3, and 6 says this, I thank my God every time I remember you. He says, in all my prayers for you all, for all of you, I always pray with joy. And I want to stop right here and pray because I realized I didn't pray before I started speaking and I never want to do that. So let's pray now. Father, we just come to you right now, Father, and I pray, Father God, that you, your spirit be here as we study your word, Father God. I pray that every deaf ear be open to the truths of your word right now, Father God. We pray that every blind eye be open to the truths of your word right now, Father God. We pray that every mind could comprehend the truths of your word this morning, and every heart be ready to receive your word this morning, Father. And we also pray, as Paul prayed for the Ephesians church, to give us a spirit of wisdom wisdom and revelation that we may know you better, Father. And we thank you for that right now. In Jesus' mighty and precious name we pray. And everyone says, amen, amen. So let's get back to this verse. He says, I thank my God every time I remember you in all my prayers for all, for all of you. I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. And then he says this in verse 6. This is where we're going to begin to focus on. He says, being confident of this. Being confident of this. He says, being sure of this. Or in Justin Wilson's old saying, I guarantee. 
I guarantee this, he says, being confident in this. Now notice what it says. He who, what, began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ. He who began a good work in you will carry it on. He says, I, I am certain of that. And then, this is what I want you to understand. You're not, uh, he who began a good work in you, when you're saved, you're saved. That's where he began the work in you. We come to know him. We come into a relationship with him. And he said, and that's where the foundation starts. And, and we build our life on Christ and what Christ done for us. We don't earn salvation. It's a free gift from God. And he starts, he who began a good work in you, the way he found you. Right? Most of us found him because our life was a mess. There's not too many people that'll tell you, I found Jesus because my life was going so great. Right? It's usually in the messes that we realize how much we need him. You see, so we understand that he says it, that he who began a good work in you is faithful to complete it. See, in other words, it began here, so you have life, but he says, now I want you to have life to the full. I, I want to heal you. I want to deliver you. I want to set you free. I want to place joy in your life. I want to place happiness in your life. He says, you've been struggling too long, and God loves you too much to leave you the mess that he found you in. He wants to deliver you from all these things. So, again... <coughs> We are, let, me, let me just pause here for a second. I, I want you to understand that, that when you're reading in the Bible uh, about a disciple, now we know Jesus had his 12 disciples who later, you, in the beginning you're going to hear their, they say the, the disciples, but then it begins to call them apostles. Okay, so what, what is a disciple? A disciple is a student, one who follows, one who learns, and an apostle is one who is sent. So Jesus began training the disciples, and can I say we're all disciples? A lot of times when the Bible's talking about disciples, he wasn't just talking to the, about the 12. He was talking to all his followers, all his believers. And we are always a disciple. We are always learning. We have, as long as we're in this body, in this world, we still got plenty to learn and plenty to grow in Christ. We will always be that. So understanding that his disciples became apostles when he sent them, and, but they were still disciples because they were still learning, right? And, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. You know, again, they sent when, when Jesus went to the, was getting ready to be betrayed, uh, Peter said, I'll never deny you. Jesus says, okay, apostle of Peter, it's time to go back to discipleship. Yes, you will. You'll deny me three times before the rooster crows. And so we're always learning. We never reach a point that we don't learn that God's, uh, uh, but he never gives up on us. But can I tell you also, the enemy never gives up on you either. He's always there looking for an opportunity to pounce. So Galatians, let's move on here. Uh, again, he who began a good work in you was, uh, will carry it to completion. So Galatians 5, I want you to understand this. It says, it is for freedom that Christ has set me free. It is for free. He didn't set me free to stay in chains. He didn't set me free to be broken. He didn't set me free. He didn't heal me. He didn't do all these things for me to remain the way I was. It is for freedom that he has set you free. And then he says this, so what? Stand firm. In other words, get ready for the fight. Don't be pushed back. Don't be bullied around by the devil. Stand firm then. And do not let yourselves. Okay? See how it begins to us again. Do not let yourselves be burdened again by the yoke of, yoke of slavery. Do not let yourself be given and stand firm. Fight the good fight. Because the enemy's coming. But it, you, you, greater is he who lives in you than he, in the wor that, he that is in the world. So we, need, we know we need to fight through him with his power. It's not by might or power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. So the spirit of God works in us. And, and this is what I want to talk about here. Galatians chapter 5, 22 through 25. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> the, I want to just read the very first four words here. And then we're going to uh, continue. But the fruit of the spirit 
I better learn how to count. That's seven, eight words. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, eight words. Okay. But the fruit of the Spirit is love. And we're going to stop here for a second. And we're, and we're going to read this, uh, the rest of it, uh, in a few minutes here. But the fruit of the Spirit. Think of this. What does fruit do? Fruit grows, right? You grow fruit. It starts from a seed. It makes a plant. The plant begins to mature. And as it matures, it makes the flowers, which makes the fruit. This fruit of the Spirit is something that grows inside of you. Okay? Let me, uh, we're going to go about the gifts of the Spirit. It talks about the gifts of the Spirit in the Bible, which we're going to read in a second. This is what I added. What is a gift? It's something given. It's not grown. It's not planted. It's just something you receive. So the fruit of the Spirit, and, and again, they're all important. The gifts of the Spirit is very important, but I'm going to show you through God's Word where the fruit of the Spirit is more important to God than the gifts of the Spirit in your life. God would rather you have the fruit of the Spirit than the gifts of the Spirit. He, I, he really wants you to have both, but if there was one, he'd say, I'd much rather you have the fruit. But fruit is grown. It's not a gift. How many of you in here plant gardens or anything? Do they autom does everything automatically grow? No. It, if you like me, I don't know. I don't know if I have a brown thumb or what you'd call it. But where I spray Roundup, grass grows. Would I till and put fertilizer and water? Dies. <laughs> I don't know what's going on. So, you know, sometimes the plants, don't, I, this week I had to yank out a zucchini plant that we had planted. It, it grew, it made flowers, but it never made one zucchini. I don't know what was going on with it. And I, I got some tomato plants, everything's there. I don't know if the bees are on strike, you know, not pollinating. I don't know what they're doing. So, but we had to yank it out. Because what? What good is it if it's not going to produce fruit? Or vegetables. I guess that's a vegetable. Right? You, you plant things to, to grow, to produce. And God plants his seed, his word in us for it to grow. Now, how many remember the parable of the seeds, which is the word of God? It says some, were, some seeds were scattered, some fell along the path. Okay? And the path, Jesus says, was hard. It, it, the things came, and the, it says the birds came. The enemy steals it. So sometimes we have to be careful that when God wants to put the fruit in our life, the enemy comes and steals it. Before it has a chance to mature and grow, the enemy comes and steals that, steal it. The second thing says some fell on rocky soil. So it didn't have much root. So when the scorching heat of things came, it disappeared. It, it didn't uh, last. Others uh, uh, let, let, fell on the uh, good soil, it was the third one, but the others fell along, among the thorns. And it says that as it was trying to grow, the worries of this world, the worries of wealth, the worries of all these things choked out what the seed was trying to produce. And so we understand that, that the, the, the seed of the Spirit that is planted in us to grow and produce these things that God wants in our life sometimes gets hindered because of its, uh, the enemy comes and steals it, the, uh, the rocky soil, there's not much roots, and when pressures of life come, and then the worries of this world keeps these things from uh, manifesting in your life. But God wants to grow those things in your life. Again, the fruit is something grown. It's not that you automatically have it. It is something we have to nurture, something we have to take care of. And this is all part of God beginning and completing a work in you. That's why he, he needs to work in your life. Sometimes, he, you know, you need to take out the, the hole and chop up the ground sometimes in our life. Sometimes, so sometimes he's trying to nurture these things in our life, and he has to do things in our life to cause these things to grow. <clears throat> so let me take you to the gifts of the Spirit from here, which isn't in your notes, okay? These are one of the things that I've added. Romans 12, chapter uh, 12, verses 6 through 8 says this. 
A gift, again, is what? Given. It's not something that grows. It's given. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. What is grace? Something you don't deserve. God gives it to you. And can I tell you something? If you, we go up actually a few verses in verse 3 from here, you know how this starts off? Right before he says about the gifts that God gives you, he tells you, but don't think of yourself more highly than you ought. That's where that verse is found. Don't think of yourself more highly than you ought, and he's about to tell you gifts you receive from the Spirit. Because what does man have a tendency to do? Oh, look at me. Look at me. God's gift. No, you're not the gift. You're the vessel God's using. The gift comes from him. It isn't you. Don't think of yourself more highly than you ought. It says this. We all have different gifts according to the grace given each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. If it is to encourage, then give encouragement. If it is giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, uh, lead or administration, do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. And then, uh, I didn't put it in Ephesians chapter 4, but that deals with the, the fivefold ministry that he gave some to be pastors and things like this. Uh, but in a 1 Corinthians chapter 12, it begins to talk about it again. And I, I think it's verse 4 I, got, I put in there, right? Starting, okay. So notice what it says here again about gifts that are given and what it says about the gifts and what they are used for. There are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit distributes them. It comes from the same Spirit, the Holy Spirit of God. It gives us the, these things. And then it says this, there are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of workings, but in all of them and in every one is the same God at work. So what is he telling us there? There are different kinds of things, but it's all supposed to be used for, for God and God's purpose. So he says all these gifts are supposed to work in unity together as one body to promote the kingdom of God. Then verse 7 says, now to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given. Why? For the common good. That means for all. It is about all. It's not about self. God didn't give you an ability or a gift to, to gratify yourself. That's why he said in the other verse, don't think more highly of yourself. God gave it to you to work for the common good of the whole body of believers. And then verse 8 says, there is, To one there is given through the Spirit a, a message of wisdom, to another a message of knowledge, by the means of the same Spirit, to another by the, uh, by, of, to the other faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by that one Spirit, to another miraculous powers, to another prophecy, to another distinguishing between spirits, and uh, to another speaking in different kinds of tongues, and still to another the interpretation of tongues. And look at verse 11, is very key. He says, all these are the work of one spirit, unity, and the, and the same spirit. And notice what it says here. And he, the spirit, distributes them to each one just as he determines. See, those gifts are for the Spirit says, God wants you to have this, and he gives it to you. It, maybe, maybe in some of these spirits, God says, you can't handle that gift. Because if I give you that gift, you're going to swell up. Remember Paul? It says that God had to give him a thorn in his flesh, a messenger from Satan to keep him from becoming conceited because of all the great revelations and miracles he was doing. Let there be rain. So we understand that the gifts come from the Holy Spirit. So we don't earn a gift of the Holy Spirit. We don't earn the gift of prophecy. If God wants you to have it, he gives it to you through his Holy Spirit. But the fruit of the Spirit is for everyone. And the fruit of the Spirit is, is to uh, be grown in, in every person's life. So let me look at... Uh, 
verse 13, and this is where I'm, uh, I was talking about, of that God's more important, in, of, it's more important to God that you have the gifts of the Spirit in your life than the gifts, uh, than the uh, gifts of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit in your life, I'm sorry. I'm speaking in tongues, but that's confused tongues. I'm really up. <laughs> but notice what it says here, verse 13, uh, chapter 13, verse 1. Again, tongues is a gift of the Spirit. Love is a fruit of the Spirit, right? And when, when we were reading in Galatians on your paper, what is the first gift of the, uh, the, the first fruit of the Spirit? Love. Most important. Everything's about love. And it says this, if I speak in the tongues, if I have this gift, if I have the gift of the Spirit to speak in tongues, he says, if I speak in tongues of men or angels, but do not have the fruit of love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. Think about that. It's more important for you to have the fruit than the gift. God wants it. Again, before that, it talks about. Uh, uh, go ahead and put it up. I've, I've, I've just have little notes, mental notes in my head that aren't working. Uh, uh, the verse before that, it's actually the end of uh, chapter 12. That, I, that you should desire gifts. Uh, maybe I didn't put it in there. Okay, yeah. This is uh, the end of chapter 12, and we're just getting into the beginning of uh, verse 1 comes next of 13. This is what he's saying. Now, eagerly desire the greater gifts. He says, we should desire the gifts of God. We should desire these things. But he says, but yet I will show you the most excellent way. And then he begins to tell you, desire the fruits of the Spirit more than the gifts of God. That that's more important. And, and that's where we're going to jump back to verse 13. He says, if I speak in the tongues of men or angels but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and I have a faith that can move mountains, but do not have the fruit of love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship so I may boast, but do not have the fruit of love, I gain nothing. You see, the most important thing to God that he wants to continue working in our life is the fruit of the Spirit. And so now we'll get to our notes here in, in Galatians chapter 5 where we're going to talk about what is the fruit of the Spirit. And I, I want to tell you, I'm not the brightest bulb on the chandelier. I admit that. So as I was reading, you know, the fruits of the Spirit, I was thinking about that's what God wants to put in you. So what does he need to take out? For this to go in. I said, well, I need to look up what are the antonyms of these things. Synonyms is the same. S, this is how I remember. S for synonym means the same. Antonym, anti, meaning against, is the opposite of it. So another good way, synonym, cinnamon roll, good, right? <laughs> See, see, when you're not the broadest bulb on the chandelier, you have to come up with little ideas like this. But it says this. So what, what I'm going to do is I'm going to read what God wants to put in us. But remember last week I talked about how only a certain amount could fit in this bottle? Right? So if this bottle is full of me, there's no room for God. He needs to get rid of some of me, get rid of some of this stuff in my life so he could place what he wants in our life. So let's, let's look at it, and the reason I was thinking about doing it this way this morning is I remember in school when you used to have those, I forget what kind of test, state tests they used to give you and things, and they used to say, uh, give you a word, and they said, what comes closest to this word, and they gave you four answers that you had to try and guess. And sometimes it was like, well, I thought I knew what that word meant, but none of these things kind of line up with what, I, with what I thought it meant. So that's why I, I went to... 
uh, the dictionary thing and, and got these um, uh, anonyms here. So it says, verse 22, but the fruit of the Spirit, fruit grows, is love. So God wants to place his love, his unconditional love inside of us. So what is the opposite of love? Hate, anger, bitterness. He needs to remove those things to make room for his love to grow. Right? Uh, any of you, again, with plants, any of you have a, you, you go uh, to the store and you buy the little plants and their growth is stunted because it's, the root ball is so thick in that little bitty uh, potting plant that it can't grow because it's, it's, it, there's just no more room. And you pull it out of there and you plant it in the ground and all of a sudden it, it shoots up. When it has room, it's going to grow. So we need to make room for what God plants in our heart to grow. So he, he, needs to, he wants love in our heart, so we need to get rid of the bitterness and anger. Then it says the next fruit is joy. So joy we know is happiness, all these things, but what is the opposite of joy? Agony, anguish joylessness, sorrow, sufferance, woefulness, cheerlessness, dejection, depression. I don't know about you, but I'd much rather have joy than all that. I'd much rather have love than the hatred and bitterness. You see, God doesn't want to leave you in that state. He wants to heal you and deliver you from all that and have his, the fruit of the Spirit grow inside of you. And then the next one is peace. So what is the opposite of peace? What does he need to remove from us to get peace inside of us? Conflict, contention, discord, strife, trouble, turmoil, unrest, upheaval, and fighting. Again, and they had so much more. I just condensed a little bit of it. The next one is forbearance. Forbearance means long-suffering in some versions of saying. It's meaning that you have patience to go through different things. That, so he wants you to have patience because you're in the, in the fight of your life. And so what is the opposite of forbearance? It is defiance, disobedience, insubordination, and resistance. He wants to place inside of us kindness, but he needs to remove callousness, coldness, disinterest, Indifference, unconcern, cruelty, harshness, animosity, dislike, hatred, and hostility. He wants to plant inside of us goodness, and he needs to remove indecency, indiscretion, debauchery, perversion, sinfulness, crookedness, dishonestness, underhandedness, uh, corruption. He wants to place faithfulness inside of us, so he needs to remove disloyalty, faithlessness, falseness, false falsity, uh, betrayal, uh, unfaithfulness. He wants to place in us gentleness, so he needs to remove harshness, inflexibility, rigid, rigidity, rigidness, uh, inconsiderate, uh, insensitive, thoughtless, crankiness, fussiness, grouchiness, grumpiness, irritability, stubbornness. Now, I know that sounds a lot like PMS. Uh, that, when I read that, I said, do y'all know what PMS means? What? No, poor man suffering. <laughs> That's what PMS means. <laughs> he, he, you don't have a good way. <laughs> Thank God my wife's out of that area in life. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. So, uh, and, and then the last thing is self-control. So, if he, to put self-control in our life, he needs to remove self-gratification, self-indulgence, excessiveness, overindulgence, shortcoming, vices, uh, weakness, indiscipline, and unrestraint. And so all these things he wants to place in us and all those things he needs to take out of us. See, he never stops working. So he, he sees all that stuff in our hearts and he says, I don't want to leave you like that. I love you too much to leave you in that shape. So I'm going to keep doing whatever I need to do to take all these things out. But can I tell you, sometimes it hurts. 
I was thinking about that. You know, anybody ever been uh, blackberrying and, and things and find that all of a sudden you got the pecan bush wrapped around you and you're like, uh-oh. If I don't move, it don't hurt, but it's going to hurt just as much taking it off. It, and that's sometimes what God, what it feels like. God's trying to remove that pecan thorny bush out of our life and it hurts. But he is faithful and he's doing it for our good. Because again, sometimes surgery is the thing that's going to heal you, but surgery can be very painful. And so with all these things, it says, against such things there is no law. <coughs> Verse 24 says, those who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. He says, since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Okay, so as we begin uh, talking about these three things again that Paul said, we know that God wants to work in our life, and Paul's given us encouragement to fight the good fight. So my, my first thing is I put training for your fight, knowing you're in a fight. Think about this, fighting the good fight, Paul said. How many of you ever watch boxing or all those uh, sports, you know, with things? Do you think that person trains for the fight the day of the fight? No. It's way before. He trains for months, maybe a year for a one-hour fight. But the problem with Christians is sometimes we got, just got God on emergency speed dial. When emergency comes, it, oh, Lord, help. But God said, why aren't you in the training? Getting yourself ready. Study to show yourself approved. Let God work in your life and put, do all these things in your life because it's going to make the transition and that battle so much easier. Brother Tommy uh, Birchfield in a discovery camp when we used to bring the kids up there always used to say this. He says, we need to get the word in us when we don't need it. So it will already be there when we do need it. You see, the training is getting ready for the fight that we know we're going to have. We, we are in a battle. You're going to be in a fight with the enemy. And you have to be ready. Don't wait till the last minute. And th that's not fighting a good fight. Oh, I'm gonna, well, I'm going to, uh, you know, walk two miles before my 15-round fight tonight. Maybe that will get me in shape for it. No. It, it's years of practice, year, years of training. It never ends. So Jesus makes this statement, training for your fight, in uh, John 16, 33. And we're gonna, we're gonna, Jesus is our coach. Jesus showed us. Jesus lived through everything. Jesus uh, helped <coughs> everything. And he, he, said, he tells this to his disciples, and you are one of his disciples. He says, I have told you these things so that in me, in Jesus, you may have peace. You won't find it anywhere else. You can look to any, anything and anyone else, you'll never find that. It. It's only in him you're going to find peace. He says, this is the one of the things I wish he would have never said. But he did say it. In this world, you will have trouble. You will have trouble. But he says, don't worry. Still have peace. He says, but take heart. I have overcame the world. I have overcome the world. In this world, you will have trouble. But you could still have peace in me because I have overcome the world. Now, I think of, of the story when Jesus and his disciples were going across the lake at night. And here comes a big storm, the waves, things. And his disciples are all freaking out, panicking. We're going to die. We're never going to make it. And you know where Jesus, Jesus was? He was in a lounge chair in the back, on the back deck. Snoring. But yet he was in the same storm, in the same boat as them. But he had peace. See, and that's the kind of peace he wants to give you. He's not saying you won't go through a storm. But he says in the middle of the storm, you could still have peace because you could trust in him. And so they, I love how they, they, they call out to him. Jesus, help us. And he stands up and, oh, ye a little faith. He calms the sea. They, it tells us that even when our struggles and panics, we could still call to him. But how many of you wouldn't have, would rather just be, man, here's this storm, but I have peace. 
He don't want you to live like, oh, it's not Jesus. Oh, please, he's hard, Lord. Help me, Lord Jesus. Oh, my goodness. Oh, not this. Oh, we're going to die. Right? How many of you would rather just be, God, you got this. My peace is in you. Training for that fight. So, so again, what, what I wanted, it's, I had put on Facebook the other day at this part is what they called for Jesus and all this and being ready that knowing you're going to have trouble in this world that we need to pray. The Bible tells us, and we've we talk, been talking about this on Wednesday nights, that we are to pray in all seasons and all conditions. Why we always just wait till trouble? And my, what I wrote the other day was, prayer costs you nothing. Not praying may cost you everything. Think about that. Prayer costs you nothing. So why, when things are going good, we our prayer life slows down? Prayer life kicks back up when trouble comes. Right? Why, why do you think maybe trouble came? Because maybe that prayer life went down. Praying costs you nothing. Not praying may cost you everything in your life. 1 Peter 5, 8 and 9 says this. Be alert and sober-minded, meaning self-control. Having self-control. Why? Because who? Whose enemy? Your enemy. My enemy. My opponent. The one I'm fighting against. Because the Bible says, for we, not, we don't battle against flesh and blood, but against powers and principalities. It says, your enemy. The devil prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to what? Devour. So verse 9 says, resist him. Don't give in. Resist. Fight the good fight. Standing firm in the faith. Resist him. But can I tell you, for so many, especially new Christians, they give up. They don't finish the race. You know, they accept Christ and they're so excited for a little while, but when the resistance comes, they don't stand firm. You know why? Because it's, it's in nature for people, animals, to take the path of least resistance. Think about it. It's, so in their mind, it, oh, it's just easier if I just give up. Let me tell you about the path of least resistance. Any, any hunters in here, deer hunters? Anything? You know, what? when they go deer hunting, they cut these rows, roads out. They may, or, or they'll make a food plot and different things. And now, part of the reason is because it's easier to shoot them out there, because shoot the deer out there because they're not in the woods. But a deer is a very suspicious animal. But yet, it'll give in to walking out into an open area where it senses danger because it's walking out there on tiptoes looking around like crazy because it's the path of least resistance. It's willing to risk its life to walk on a clear path, to walk in a, to a food plot where it could get something easy than it is to stay in the woods and walk and deal with all those things. It's easier to take the path of least resistance and sometimes that path will have you destroyed. Human nature. Oh, I just give up. I'm tired of fighting the devil. I quit. Do you, act, do you know that actually January 12th, do you know what that is officially called? January 12th. It's called Quitter's Day. Why do you think is that? Because January 1st, everybody makes New Year's resolutions. And can I tell you something? It's easy to get started. It's easy to start the race. Oh, I'm going to do, and all these New Year's resolutions are all good things for I'm going to lose weight, I'm going to get in shape, I'm going to all do this. But then this resistance starts, and by January 12th, the average person quits, gives up. I ain't running this race again. I'll start again next year, January 1st. 
right? We quit those things. So we need to understand that we need to resist the enemy and keep on pressing on. He says, therefore, stand firm in the faith because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is going through. Uh, through the same kind of sufferings. It's not just you. It's every believer. Ephesians 4.27. I'm, I'm going to speed up here uh, for time. He says, Ephesians 4.27. Do not give the devil a foothold. Don't give him a foothold. Don't allow him. Don't give him any area in your life that he can attack. He's a smart. He's smart. He knows how to attack. He knows where your weakness is. And that's where he's coming. He's not going to come for your strong point. Right? I always joke about my dieting. You know, for me to fall off my diet, the devil could put 14 cases of peanut butter in my pantry. Ain't got to worry about me touching any of that. I don't care how much of a sweet tooth I got. Why? Because I don't like peanut butter. So you think he's going to attack you where you're strong? Oh, what he's going to do? Let me slip in a honey bun in there. Oh, that's a weakness. <laughs> Let me slip in a cinnamon roll in there, right? What happened? He knows your weak spots, and that's the way he's going to attack you. He's not going to attack you where you're strong. So don't give him a place. Isaiah 4, 64, verse 8 says, Yet you, Lord, are our Father. We are the what? The clay. You are the potter. The potter forms the clay into a vessel that he wants to make. We are all the work of your hand. But you need to understand about the clay. The potter could only make out of the clay depending on how the consistency of the clay that is in his hand. You see, if the clay is too dry, it, w it won't form right. If the clay is too wet, it's going to collapse as it's building it. So the potter who is God, will have to either add moisture or remove moisture from the clay. So as God wants to build and work in your life, he needs to sometimes put things in our life, sometimes take things out of our life. See, that's why sometimes we're praying for God to, to take this out of my life and let, let get out of this, but God's saying, no, this is what I'm using to change you. This is what I'm using to make you who I want you to be. Sometimes we're praying for God to give us something, and God says, ah, if I get glad you that, I'll be your downfall. You're not ready for this. Then he goes on to say, and we know, verse uh, Romans 8, 28, which we used earlier uh, for our offering, he says, and we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. In all things, the good the bad, and the ugly. And I mentioned earlier today that sometimes he needs to remove things in our life, like a surgery. It doesn't mean it's a good thing. It could be a tragedy in our life, but he'll use it, okay? Uh, you know, we ask God, that, and we sing sometimes, purify our heart. You know how you purify something? You got to turn the heat up. So sometimes God has to Hey, hey, you're not, you're not listening. Turn up the heat a little bit. you still not listening. Turn up the heat a little bit. you still not listening. You're going off the stove onto the butane burn outside. Right? God will do whatever he needs to do to get you to submit to him and follow his purpose and plan for your life. He never gives up on you. Amen. It doesn't mean that it's a painless transition. It could be very painful. My shoe's untied. See, Spurge, you got a perfect chance for a joke right now. <laughs> he always tells me my shoes are untied. Hebrews 12, 1 and 3 says this. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud, cloud of witnesses, let us, point to yourself, let us throw off everything that hinders, things that weigh us down, things that... Uh, set us back he says let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin and i always say this just because it's not sin doesn't mean it's not hindering you and you walk with god he says throw off everything that hinders and the sin the sin part is obvious 
The problem is a lot of things we don't think is sin is hindering us. Then he goes on to say, and to do what? Run, running that race again. Let, let us run with perseverance, which means you're going to have a fight. You're going to be through this. Don't give up. Run the race with perseverance. Keep on going. The race that is marked out for us. Each and every one of us have a race to run. Fight the good fight and can finish your race. He says, and this is how we do it. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and the perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he did what? Endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. He went through, he fought the good fight, did what he had to do, he finished his race. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. If you lose heart, you end up giving up. Now, let me say this. Jesus had 12 disciples. Right? He's the potter, we are the clay. Out of his 12 disciples, 11 went on to be apostles. One did not. Now, was it that Jesus was not a good enough administrator, a good enough teacher, a good enough thing that Judas failed? Wouldn't it be ridiculous for Judas to say, Jesus, it's your fault? You didn't train me good enough? But yet 11 others moved on. What was wrong with Judas? He wasn't the right clay. See, Judas, it says he used to help himself to the treasure. Judas was still all about Judas. Judas never surrendered and gave everything to God. That's why. It wasn't Jesus' fault that Judas turned out the way he did. It was Judas was just a dry lump of clay that God could do nothing with. Because he, he chose not to get rid of those things in his life. He chose to keep them. It was all about him. He used to help himself to those things. And, and again, what, I'm going to sell them out for 30 pieces of silver. It was about Judas, 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 not about Jesus. See, it wasn't Jesus' fault for Judas. We can't, sometimes people want to blame other people for their own fault. Amen. So finish our race. Galatians 5, 7 through 9. We want to finish our race. He says, you were running a good race. But what happened? Who cut in on you and kept you from obeying the truth? You were doing so good. That kind of persuasion does not come down from the one who calls you. And he says this, a little yeast works through the whole batch of dough. He says, you better be careful what you're listening to. You better be careful who you're talking to. You better be careful because a little bit of yeast affects the whole batch of dough. He says, you were doing great. You were running your race, but you got tripped up. Philippians 3, 12 through 14 says, and this is Paul saying, and this is where I said, we're, we're still all disciples and we're going to remain that way. Not that I have already obtained all this, he says, God's still working on me. I'm still, I'm still a work in progress. We're all still works in progress. Or I have already arrived at my goal. He says, N I haven't. He says, but what I do is I press on. I'm not giving up. I'm not quitting. I'm going to press on to take hold of that which Christ took hold of me. And I love that statement. To take hold of why Christ took hold took hold of me. Christ took hold of you to set you free and to have you have a full, fulfilled life. So that's the reason he took hold of you. So take hold of why he took hold of you. Don't settle for anything less. Don't give up. Let God continue to work in your life. <coughs> Thank you, Sister Hazel. No, 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 amen. Verse 13 says, Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. But the one thing I do is forgetting the past, forgetting what is behind, and straining. Again, fighting that fight, not giving up. Straining means effort. You're going to have to hold on, stand firm toward what is ahead. I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenly, heavenward in Jesus Christ. I have to keep my eyes on the finish line. When you begin to get weary and tired, 
focus on the finish line. Do, did you ever notice like these long marathon runners, they, they're about half, half the fall out, then they see the finish line and all of a sudden they could take off again. It's like they get another win because they focus on the finish line, finishing strong. So next time you're going through things, finish strong. <coughs> Luke 18, 1, Jesus told the disciples a parable to show them that they should always pray. Not sometimes, always. Not when times are bad, just bad, but in good times. That you should always pray and what? Never give up. God does not want you to give up. God does not want you to quit. Paul was cheering us on. Finish your race. Fight the good fight and finish your race and keep the faith. Don't give it up. Galatians 6, 9 says, let us not become weary. He's telling you that you're in a fight. You're going to become tired. How many of you have seen fights when they're in the 14th and 15th round? They just can't go no more. And sometimes it's the sure will of the person that has, knows this is the last round that carries him through to victory. Know that you will get tired, but you're trained, you're ready for the proper time. You will reap a harvest if, if we don't give up. Finish your race. Worship team, if you'd come on up and start making your way here as we close out, keeping the faith. Keeping the faith. I've fought the good fight. I've finished the race. And I have kept the faith, he said. 1 Timothy 6, 18 through 21 says this. Command them to do good. To be rich in good deeds. And to be generous and willing to share. In this way they will lay up treasures for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age. So that, they would, so that they may what? Take hold of life that is truly life. That you could take hold of life that is truly life. And he, then he tells Timothy, Paul speaking to Timothy, he says, guard, protect, be ready. He says, guard what has been entrusted to your care. And he says, turn away from godless chatter. Don't sit there and listen to it, Timothy. Turn away from godless chatter and the opposing ideas what is falsely called knowledge, which some of you have professed and in doing so has what? Wandered from the faith. Grace be with you. See, sometimes we just want to give up. But God does, never gives up on you. Can I tell you that? Don't give up on God because he will never give up on you. He's always for you. And that's where we want to encourage you. 2 Timothy, again, 4, 7 says this. I have fought the good fight, and I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. I know people get weary. People get tired. But God wants to refresh you, and he's saying, don't give up. Don't give up. He is for you. If he is for you, who can be against you? Fight the good fight. Know you're in a fight. And fight the good fight. Finish your race. And keep the faith. Because my eye is on the finish line. No matter what troubles this world sends us, my eye is on the finish line. I can have peace in the middle of a storm. Where chaos is going around, I can live in the peace of Jesus Christ. So if you want a refreshing today, we're going to worship with a song called, This is How I Fight My Battles. The Bible tells us three things, important things in a Christian's life, is we are to worship and praise God for who He is and what He does. We are to get in His Word and study His Word so our mind is changed. And we are to pray and never give up. So if you want a refreshing today, I ask you just to stand to your feet. I ask everyone just to stand to your feet. Suzanne, if you turn that light switch off right there for me. I ask you to come down to the altars. Pastor Island, if you would help me. We're just going to anoint you with all. 
for a time of refreshment. You've been weary. You, you feel like giving up. Or maybe you not don't even feel like giving up. You just say, I'm ready. I'm ready to go. Let, uh, pass the baton. We're running a marathon, uh, one of those uh, relay races, and I'm ready to take the stick. Let's go. I'm ready to move on. Amen. Pastor Allen, come on with me. Come on. You can make your way to the front for a refreshing this morning.
Let's lift up our hands right now. Father, you know what's going on in each and every one of our lives right now, Father. Father, but I pray that you give us the peace of Jesus on our life, Father God. That it may look like we're surrounded, Father God, by the enemy. That it seems to be no way out. But, Father, we know your word says where there seems to be no way, you will make a way, Father God. So, Father, I just lift up each and every person right here, Father God. I pray that we fight the good fight. No more, devil, shall we give in to you. We know your plan. We know your schemes. We know how you work. We're going to stand firm. We're going to resist him. We resist you, Satan, right now. I pray right now that every plan, trap, or snare that has been placed upon your life would just fail right now. And I speak the blessings of God upon your life right now, that you have healing, deliverance, and freedom right now in your life, in every part of your life, that we're going to be able to run our race and finish our race because our eyes are going to be fixed on Jesus and he's there at the finish line waiting for us. And we're going to keep the faith. We're never going to give up. We're never going to quit. From this day forward, in Jesus' name we pray. And everyone says, Amen. Amen. Let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise this morning. Amen. Amen. If you've, if you've never been water baptized or if you've given your heart, you just want to look a whole new refreshing. This Wednesday night, come on out for water baptism. You didn't have to sign up already. You could fill out the form that night. Amen. So we'll see you then. God bless you. We love you. Fight the good fight. Amen. God bless you.